Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joe Schwab, and I'm going to be focusing on predictive algorithms in spine surgery. So why spine surgery? Well, each year about $100 billion is spent on spine surgery in America. If you contrast that to the restaurant industry, which is a $5 billion industry, spine surgery is a very large um, uh, market. If you dive down a little bit more closely at lumbar fusion surgery, there are about half a million lumbar fusion surgeries performed each year in the U.S. And it's estimated that they have about a 5% uh, complication rate. That 5% is, is considered preventable. And that represents about a $1.8 billion market. You can imagine that if you, if you could predict which patients are likely to have one of these preventable complications, you might be able to intervene and prevent that patient from suffering from the complication. That would, of course, be attractive to the patient, first and foremost, but it would also be attractive if you're an insurance company or if you're engaging in a bundled payment system uh, from, a, from an administrative standpoint. So if that's the case, why, why don't we have sophisticated algorithms already in place? Well, part of the reason is that there, there just isn't great data out there. Most, most studies have suffer from, from relatively small numbers, or they have relatively rudimentary methodological uh, backgrounds. And so you don't have, at the most, you may have a C statistic, but most of the models are not calibrated or they're not validated. They rarely provide any expl explanation of their algorithm, and there, there are no decision curve analyses. If you contrast that to our group, we have 35,000 well-annotated spine surgery cases. Um, these, these algorithms are already being used clinically. Um, they, most of them have already been published, although there's many more uh, in, in, uh, in line. We provide explanations uh, to, to the provider and also to the individual as to what went into the algorithm for that individual patient. And importantly, we provide decision curve analyses, which I'll, I'll touch on in a moment. So this is just one of our algorithms, and we have uh, thus far 30. This is an algorithm that we, we developed to try to predict which one of our patients would be most likely to, to uh, require prolonged opiate use after a specific surgery, after anterior cervical discectomy infusion. And so we looked at our, our, um, our, 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 uh, our database, and we have 2,700 patients who, who met criteria for this study. And we found that 10% of them actually utilized prolonged opiate use after surgery. So this, this is a problem. <clears throat> And so we use various uh, methodologies to investigate which one would be the best at predicting which patients are, are going to require these opiates, and we, we chose the stochastic gradient boosting algorithm. So um, with, with all of these algorithms, you want to make sure that you you're, have a well-calibrated model. And what that means is, <clears throat> with a calibration curve, that through the course of your predictions from 0% to 100%, that your, your predictions are actually accurate. And in a perfect world, your prediction model would have a slope um, uh, uh, of 1. And so you'd see the diagonal line on the screen. That's a perfect slope. And the intercept would be 0. If you look at the intercept for our study here, as an example, it approaches 0. If you look at the slope, it approaches 1. So this is a well-calibrated model. Very important if you're going to use this model. It's accurate. <clears throat> The discriminatory power, 0.81, this is also quite good. And I think um, this is a very important curve, the decision analysis curve. So m this has only been around for about 10 years, but it's actually probably the most important because it allows you to assess, does my algorithm provide a net benefit for the patient? And decision curve analyses will become more common and will be required in, in, uh, in predictive algorithms in the future. And, and this, uh, this curve demonstrates that our algorithm does indeed provide a net benefit uh, to the patient. So uh, a specific example of this algorithm, this is a patient of mine, 65-year-old male patient who has cervical stenosis. We were planning a one-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. The patient smokes a pack a day. They're also taking OxyContin due to the pain. They're taking enalapril. They're also on gabapentin, which is a neuropathic pain medicine. And they, they, um, they do have Medicare. So you take those parameters and you, you go to our website. This is an example of our website, which is up and going. It's sorg-ai.com. We also have mobile apps. And so when you, when you go to our website, you can put in these parameters. All the parameters are set to, to no, but you can change them to the affirmative, as the case may be. And you, you, you go through this, um, and once you've done this, uh, once you've put in all the parameters, the, the algorithm will give you a probability. takes a moment. And aside from the probability of this patient requiring prolonged opiates, it also provides an explanation. And so what you see below there, these bars, 
allow, from, from an individual patient perspective, you can explain to the patient, you know, the reason why your probability is, is X is because of these parameters. These parameters, and perhaps uh, in some cases in, in our other algorithms, it might be smoking or it might be obesity, which pushes their probability higher. It's much more tangible for the patient to understand this, and it kind of takes away the black box criticism of many of these machine learning algorithms. So in this case, the, the patient's probability of a prolonged opiate dependence was 44%. Now this would trigger a response that's far, far above the threshold that we've set. And so this patient would then be, would be categorized into a patient who's at high risk and would go through a special program to try and counsel them about the risks of opiates to hopefully try to prevent this from, from being an issue. And of course you can see that. Why, why is that important? Of course that's important for many reasons, the, the social reasons I think everybody's aware of. But also patients who are on prolonged opiates, they tend to use a lot of resources. They're going to be calling the physician's office office more frequently, they go to urgent care centers more frequently, they show back up in the emergency department, and they're admitted more frequently. All of these are, are, uh, are costly. So currently we have 30 applications, as I mentioned, that are, that are deployed or are in development, and, and many more ideas uh, uh, for applications. And these applications include things for non-home discharge prediction. So again, you can imagine, who would be interested in that? Well, if you're, if you're an insurance company or if you're running a healthcare company and you're, you're uh, engaging in a bundled payer, uh, payer system, you would want to know which of my patients are going to need to go to a SNF, because of course that's very costly. Opiate dependence, uh, again, we have multiple algorithms developed for opiate dependence depending upon the, the, um, the procedure to be performed. We have survival predictions in multiple different types of cancer, and, and why is that important? So you can imagine, um, in, in my practice, I take care of a lot of folks who have spinal metastases, and you want to know how long this person is likely to survive. If, if their survival is, is going to be over two years, you want to make sure, if, you're, if they're indicated for surgery, that the surgery you're going to provide is going to last for two years. Alternatively, and, and perhaps more importantly in some ways, if a patient's only going to live two months, you, maybe you don't want to do surgery at all. Maybe, maybe even though there's an indication, it may not be the right thing. And certainly from, from that patient's perspective, it wouldn't be, and of course from a cost perspective as well. Complication predictive models. Now, there's, there are a lot of people that would be interested in this. If you imagine yourself, you're, you're, you're thinking about having a hip replacement, but you're a little bit worried about the complications therein. Wouldn't it be great if you could go and find out what are the risks of me having a complication? I'm not too worried about the population. I'm talking about my hip replacement. I want to know what my risks are. And this is possible. Of course, having that direct to, to patient uh, interaction, that's another, another level of scrutiny from the FDA. But, but certainly from a, from, a, from a healthcare perspective, you can do this. Uh, uh, from from a, um, uh, an insurance company perspective or from a healthcare provider perspective already. And we have many models that predict uh, complications. Um, next steps, in addition to, to enhancing and, and extending our algorithms outside of orthopedics, we're also using genetic-based uh, predictive models using the partner's biobank uh, to incorporate that into our predictive models to see if that can enhance some of our predictions. And we're also uh, venturing into deep learning to try to incorporate image acquisition, image classification into our predictive models. This is, the, this is a, uh, um, our, our website. Well, it's also a mobile app, as I said, uh, sorg-ai.com. Thank you very much.